Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Is economics still relevant? A roundtable discussion of economics as a guide to managing the economy. Uh, I want to introduce our, our panelists here, Professor Marvin Goodfriend, Professor uh, Stephen Spear, and uh, Professor Bennett McCallum. I'm sure you all know these uh, distinguished faculty members. I'm uh, uh, Professor Dennis Eppel, and also head of, uh, of economics. I want to thank uh, the director of undergraduate economics, uh, Carol Goldberg, who uh, just stepped out and avoided <laughs> the acknowledgement. And our undergraduate advisor, Stephanie Vega, for uh, uh, organizing uh, this event. The event is sponsored by the Carnegie Mellon Economics Society. The uh, next event sponsored by the Society is uh, co-sponsoring a talk by Prime Minister Rood of uh, Australia at 5 o'clock in Rangos Hall on, uh, did I say, September 24th? Uh, okay, in terms of our format today, the, uh, uh, each of the panelists is going to speak for five minutes to get the ball rolling, and meanwhile there are cards being distributed, or will be distributed, to all of you to write questions and uh, pass them forward, and uh, I will then uh, uh, read them, and we'll see if we can stump the panel today. Uh, uh, the, the motivation for this, I think, is clear enough. Uh, the turmoil in uh, the uh, world uh, markets of late, the world economy, uh, and also the kind of lively debate, if you've been reading the web page in the econ web, you've seen the articles from The Economist and New York Times and Business Week uh, discussing uh, the uh, role that economic policy advice has played uh, in the uh, last uh, several years and the last few months. Also a uh, lively exchange between two Nobel laureates, uh, or at least lively commentary, if not direct exchange, by Robert Lucas and, uh, and Paul Krugman. So again, welcome. Without further ado, we'll uh, turn to the panel and uh, let uh, uh, Professor uh, Goodfriend lead off. <coughs> whole area mic uh, I'm not sure about that. You can hear me all right? Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, the answer to this question, uh, the extent to which economics um, can guide the economy or should guide the economy, is is, is very easy one for me to answer. Uh, my interest in my a former job was at the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve was responsible for managing the monetary economy of the United States. Um, there's no way for the monetary economy to be managed uh, uh, independently of some central organization of Federal Reserve system. Uh, in fact, uh, it's the Federal Reserve's primary job is to stabilize the purchasing power of money. And um, it's not very topical to talk about the successes of the Federal Reserve in the last three decades in learning how to stabilize the purchasing power of, of money. But one of the great successes of the Federal Reserve in the past 30 years is that it has done so. And in order to understand what economics has contributed to um, the stability of the U.S. economy and the world economy, you have to start with the bad old days before the central banks of the world and the Federal Reserve in particular learned to stabilize the purchasing power of money. And I don't want to get into too much detail here, but in the bad old days, we called monetary policy stop-go monetary policy because the central bank would be reluctant to raise interest rates against inflation until inflation became a problem in everybody's mind. And once that happened, expectations of inflation would be elevated, and the Federal Reserve would have no choice but to create a recession, weaken labor markets, uh, weaken wage growth in order to bring down inflation, in order to bring down inflation expectations. In the language of monetary policy, the Federal Reserve had no choice except to restore lost credibility for price stability or for stable prices. Without stabilizing the purchasing power of money, 
the Federal Reserve would not have no no way in a no way to use monetary policy to stabilize the real economy. The only thing the Federal Reserve has that makes it special is a monopoly on the ability to create paper money or electronic blips that represent money held at, at the Federal Reserve banks by, by commercial banks. If the Federal Reserve does not stabilize the real value of that currency, then its leverage over the real economy is zero. So the point I want to make here is that inflation stability has to be the primary job of a central bank. And the, and the second point is that the central bank in the United States has succeeded in stabilizing the purchasing power of, of, of money in the past 20, 30 years. A great success, um, given that people were very doubtful about its capacity to do so as late as 1978. A um, very famous Keynesian economist of the day, Jim Tobin, thought that if the Federal Reserve were to try to stabilize inflation, which is to bring it down from 10 or 12 percent a year, which was the average in the late 1970s, to something uh, uh, near price stability, that the Federal Reserve would succeed only in creating a 10-year Great Depression. There was what you might say a great defeatism on the part of Keynesian economists, which were uh, the reigning authorities of the day, that the central bank should not attempt to bring the inflation rate down and stabilize the purchasing power of money, because to do so would create a protracted recession and wreck the economy. Well, that experiment was run. It was run by Paul Volcker, leading the Fed in the early 80s, succeeded. And it turned out that when you brought the inflation rate down, not only did the inflation rate come down, not only did the price stability uh, occur, not only did uh, the central bank get more leverage over the economy, but we had two of the longest business expansions in United States history since 1980. And the point, one of the points I want to leave, we, leave you with is, in the bad old days with stop and go monetary policy, where the Fed was insufficiently preemptive against inflation, if you will, it would bring business expansions to an end prematurely because inflation would get out of control. The Fed would be reluctant to raise interest rates in order to stabilize inflation. And by the time it got around to being willing to raise interest rates, it would have to create a recession to reverse the loss of credibility that it suffered. And so business expansions prior to the Volcker era in 1980 were very short. It's essentially, the business expansion has doubled in length since 1980. We've had two of the longest expansions. Where am I going with this? I want you to think of an analogy to medical science. Medical science is all about increasing life expectancy by dealing with diseases. But when we, when we succeed against disease, we, we extend life expectancy. And what happens? We don't live forever. We die of something else. And it's very important to understand where we are today, that the success against inflation by extending the life expectancy of the average business expansion and, and, and doing something right on the government side, the central bank side, has given more freedom for markets to get it wrong. I don't believe any discussion of what's happened in the last two years should be undertaken without that simple point in mind. No one would want to argue that, you know, because we've dealt with diseases that used to kill us at age 40 or 50, and now we're dying of cancer and other diseases which hit mainly older people, that medical science should be rolled back. My opinion from this perspective is we need to continue to stabilize prices and let markets learn from their mistakes. Because in the end, what brings business expansions to a close now is going to be more or less as overdoing asset pricing. And so the markets need to have more room to run to recognize their mistakes. And I, I'll be happy to take questions later. I, I don't know if I've gone five minutes or not, but that's all I have to say. Thank you, Barbara. We will go in alphabetical order, so uh, the calendar is next. You've been studying the alphabet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, since I didn't work for the Fed, my, my, my reaction as an academic is to kind of react to these things that have been written and that have been called to our attention by... Uh, by the uh, economics department's web page. Um, especially, I think especially notable are the pieces in the Economist magazine followed by uh, Bob Lucas's dissent and, and the one in the uh, New York Times. Um, I won't say why. <laughs> Um, so, I, I, I want to say something, I want to s say something about the piece by Bob Lucas, which was called um, 
in defense of the dismal science. And he concludes this piece by saying, I'm going to quote him, that he sees no connection between the reality of the macroeconomics that these people, and he's referring there specifically to Ben Bernanke and Rick Mishkin, and to the, and the mainstream of monetary policy analysis. So he sees no connection between the reality of the macroeconomics that these people uh, present and the caricature provided by the critics whose views dominated the economists' briefing. End of quote. Now, I think he's just really correct in, in that, that he's exactly right with that statement and pretty much threw out his, his one-page article. Uh, I think it's a very carefully written piece in which he strongly defends Bernanke and Mishkin against the criticisms that were made by the various people quoted in the Economist briefing. Now, now this is rather striking because, because um, uh, Bernanke and Mishkin are both uh, at the old Keynesian edge of the new Keynesian economics, while Lucas is right at the extreme other edge, right at the real business cycle edge among new Keynesian economists. He wouldn't support them a large fraction of the time. Um, there are a lot of ways in which he, he sees things differently than, than Bernanke and Mishkin. But he sees that the criticisms, the specific criticisms that are being leveled at them in the writings that were present in the, in, in the Economist's uh, briefing were just not accurate. They were misguided. They were being put, put forth by people who don't specialize in research but specialize in blogs. And, and Lucas, he's, he's careful and honest and responsible about what he says rather than making extreme statements um, with distortions in order to try and pick up support for certain views among people who, are, who don't have training in economics, basically. So, I mean, I think that that's... Um, so I commend his piece to you. The, the other thing I think that one needs to, uh, to keep in mind, so I'm, I'm going to put a little table on the board, and we might have argument about it. But, uh, so what I'm going to put on the board is, 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 is my evaluation of the extent to which uh, Active researchers in macroeconomics, people who are both active and, and, and respected researchers, belong to the three kind of camps of economists that, that uh, Krugman talks about and that are recognized by other people. And so I'm going to give you two lines. One is for uh, the macro for, for, for all people who are macroeconomists. And I'm, I'll use different names. I'm not going to use this saltwater, freshwater business, which is silly. But there are people who are real business cycle supporters. There are people who are new Keynesian slash new neoclassical synthesis supporters. And there are Keynesians. So I'll call them old Keynesians. <laughs> And, and I would say that among all the people who do macroeconomics as their profession, that about maybe as much as 40% of them are real business cycle guys. I'm not sure if that's right or not. Uh, geez, my figures don't add up. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say about 45%. 45% were uh, new, new Keynesians. So let me check, make this 35. <laughs> it's 45. And then, but then, this, this is all the people who are, who are doing macroeconomics. And there are a large fraction of that group who really are concerned entirely with growth theory 
and with other long-run concerns that are quite distinct from stabilization policy. They're not doing monetary economics, they're not doing fiscal policy. And so I want to uh, give another listing for people who do monetary and fiscal, fiscal policy. And then I would say that about 20% are real business cycle guys, and I didn't have any fives this time, so I could add it up. And about 70% of those people fall in the category. It's neither the extreme real business cycle people, who, who, who are distinguished by their belief that prices adjust quickly in all markets so that there's never, there's never any, there's no nominal rigidity that causes uh, any market to uh, keep from clearing uh, month by month. Uh, so they're between them and the uh, and 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 the old Keynesians who uh, think that everything is stuck all the time, and that the way out is for the government to uh, buy things with fiscal policy. That's what Krugman is supporting. And the people in the middle are trying to com have, have have been working for <coughs> quite a few years, trying to to build a science that uh, combines features of price stickiness and rational design of uh, behavior by the individuals with, well, they're trying to design rational models that are both in, involve rationality and market clearing, but also some uh, uh, price stickiness. So I, I'm just going to leave that up there. For, I think we may want to re return to it every now and then. And I would say, as my one <laughs> sort of jab at the Krugman article, that I think much of the time he's sort of trying to jump back and forth between these two things in a way that's designed to mislead people. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Professor Steve's here. Down. A minute. Go, Ben. Thank you. Um, what I've seen in a lot of the criticisms that uh, have, have uh, appeared are really two questions. One, why didn't we predict this? Why could our models not tell us something like this was going to happen? Uh, and secondly, were we as a profession in any way culpable in this? And I don't see economics as a precise enough science yet that our models could have predicted. And certainly, yeah, there were some economists like Nuri, uh, Nuri Rubini at uh, NYU and, and Bob Schiller who saw what was going on in the housing market and disagreed with this notion that somehow housing prices could never fall. Um, <coughs> I'd like to address the second question. Uh, do we as economists bear any responsibility? And I think we do. And I think we do specifically because we let what is a very special result in general equilibrium theory get hijacked under the rubric of this sort of free markets ideology that somehow <clears throat> markets are always the superior mechanism for allocating resources. Okay? Uh, this particular um, ideological convention has a basis in economics in general equilibrium theory and what is known as the first welfare theorem. Now the first welfare theorem says that under certain circumstances, unregulated markets deliver efficient outcomes. And we're all economists. Efficiency means Pareto optimality, which means you can't make one person better off without making somebody else worse off. Okay? Um, the problem with the first welfare theorem, the specialness of the first welfare theorem, comes from the conditions that have to hold for it to be viable, for it to be uh, true. Uh, there are four conditions. Uh, the first is that markets have to be perfectly competitive. You cannot have agents in the economy whose trades will affect the price directly. You can't have monopolies. You can't have oligopolies. Uh, the second requirement is that agents are perfectly informed. They have to know everything relevant that there is to know about the economy. And we have some evidence that the prices themselves can communicate some of this. But more importantly, uh, this information, this knowledge has to be symmetric. You can't have information asymmetries in the form that somebody knows something about what's going to happen that other people don't know and that they can then take advantage of the people who don't know in terms of trades. So insider trading is a, uh, an example of this. Uh, the third requirement is that markets have to be complete. 
This means at a minimum that every agent in the economy can access any particular market. In a dynamic and stochastic environment, market completeness requires that every agent has access, full access to the credit markets. They can transfer wealth in any denomination as long as they you know, don't end up in default and don't end up bankrupt between different periods of time. Uh, when you take risk into account, market completeness means that you can insure yourself against every possible risk in the economy. Okay? Finally, the, uh, the theorem requires that there be no externalities. So externalities are <coughs> economic benefits or costs that don't get reflected in the price that the market sets. So the classic example of this would be pollution dumped into a river by a factory for free, even though it has health consequences downstream. Uh, in modern growth theory, the theory of endogenous growth uh, puts a lot of emphasis on human capital accumulation. That's what you guys are all doing here, studying. Uh, investing in your own human capital. This is going to be a benefit to the person who employs you that they have not paid for and that their product will not reflect uh, uh, that, that benefit. Uh, Lester Lave will tell you that if you look at the price of a car and the gasoline that runs it, that this is nowhere near to capturing the full external benefits when you take into account things like climate change uh, and <coughs> congestion effects and so on. So these four conditions, and in fact, uh, there's a very, very large literature. It actually goes back roughly to about the time that the, uh, Finn Kidlin and Ed Prescott began their work on, on the real business cycle model. But exploring models, economic models, in which one or the other of these conditions fails and the first welfare theorem doesn't hold, and then trying to look at what are the implications of this. Now, when we look at the real world, the reason I'm holding this up is that, first of all, the real world is full of monopolies. It is full of oligopolies. Um, anyone who's taken a game theory course and studied repeated games knows that uh, one of the results there is that even oligopolies can act like monopolies by way of just tacit collusion. So we don't have perfect competition. Um, information asymmetry exists all over the place. You see this in, in insider trading as, as an example. In fact, there's a whole literature in what's come to be called a sort of new uh, public finance uh, where these sorts of agency relationships, situations in which, uh, for example, the CEO of a company knows a lot more than the shareholders, uh, these have macroeconomic implications, and people are starting to look at these. Um, market completeness, uh, there's a whole vast literature uh, indicating that markets are not complete, okay? Uh, and in some cases, they can't even be complete. Uh, if you believe that the human life cycle is important and you're looking at what have come to be called overlapping generations models, uh, there's a whole class of agents born into these economies who have no opportunity to trade on markets that existed in the past or will exist in the future after you die. So clearly there's market uh, uh, incompleteness in the real world. And I've mentioned examples of these externalities. So it seems to me that one of the things, that, that one of the ways we've been culpable is in not standing up forcefully enough and saying, look, the first welfare theorem result is special. To simply blindly assert that free markets are good, that you can never do better than, than uh, a market mechanism, I think is simply wrong, and we have not said enough about that. So I'll stop with that. Do we have uh, questions? Uh, so if there are cards available, um, uh, send your questions down, and uh, we'll put the panel to work. While they're uh, collecting uh, uh, questions from you all, I'll ask a question or two uh, of my own. Uh, so here, here's a question. Uh, was there a financial bubble? Okay. What, what's a bubble? And uh, was there a bubble? <laughs> <laughs> and housing markets are in, in more general. Uh, so whenever I get asked this question, I like to tell a story about how hard it is to identify so-called bubbles ex ante. And I think the idea of a bubble makes sense only if you can identify extreme asset price fluctuations ex ante. Prices go up and down, and sometimes they go up and down quite a lot in an extreme way. And the story I like to tell is about Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan famously called the equity markets irrationally exuberant, and I believe it was 1996, when they went up from something like 4,000 to 6,000 in a couple of years. 
looked like a huge run-up in the mid-1990s, but equity prices went up and stayed up more or less at 10,000 for the next few years, and even now they're at 9,000. I think, you know, you'd have to say that Greenspan got that one wrong. Uh, so it's, you know, Exhibit A, he just, uh, you know, he got a lot of publicity for calling markets irrationally exuberant, but basically I think he was uh, insufficiently exuberant. Then, and, you know, so I was at the open market meetings all through this period. Comes a decade later, and he's looking at house prices, and he's saying, you know, I got it wrong last time. I'm not going to be so quick to call housing bubble irrationally exuberant. He didn't do it. So he managed to get it wrong twice. He said that equity prices were too high in the 1990s, and arguably I would think that they weren't. They've been sustained more or less higher than 6,000. And then in, the, in this decade, he got it wrong because he didn't call this thing an extreme fluctuation. So the lesson that I take from this is how hard it is, even for experts, to get it right on ex ante, calling things bubbles. I'd add something to that, and that is uh, in both the housing run-up of housing prices and the so-called dot-com bubble back in the 90s, whether that was a bubble or not, again, is, is a difficult thing to say. The common refrain you heard among practitioners was, the world has changed. Nothing will be the same again. Housing prices will never fall. Uh, there'll never be another recession. I remember uh, we had, uh, I think it was Michael Mandler, who was the commencement speaker, uh, for one of the MBA classes, and he basically got up and told him, if you think there's never going to be a recession again, you're nuts. <laughs> and he was practically booed off the stage. So this, this uh, short-sightedness people have or, or failure of, of understanding history, you only have to look back at history of housing prices to see that, yes, in fact, they fluctuate. So if you're basing an investment strategy on the expectation that this thing's never going to go down, you're either stupid or you're too big to fail. <laughs> So, so here's a question uh, from the audience uh, addressed to, to uh, Marvin. Speaking of Fed success against inflation, what will happen when the trillions sitting idle on bank balance sheets finally start getting lent, paren the idle money pumped in by the Fed? Close uh, print. Good question. Uh, so um, I think the problem you have in mind is that the Fed's balance sheet is large because the Fed has gotten in the, in the business of what I call credit policy essentially taking onto its balance sheet lending that the private sector wouldn't do last year to the tune of about a trillion dollars, largely funded by excess reserves or reserves which could be inflationary in normal times. So I think the way I would rephrase the question is the problem is suppose the Fed is unwilling or unable because of political reasons to get out of the credit business and shrink its balance sheet back to what it was, what then? Well, my, my feeling is that the Fed can use um, two tools, and actually Ben Bernanke has said as much in his monetary policy report to Congress in July, which is worth reading, but you have to read quite a ways into it to get the content. You have to go to page 36. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the content is that the Fed has, has received emergency authority to pay interest on reserves, and interest on reserves can put a floor under the, under the federal funds rate, which is the interbank interest rate that the Fed uses to guide the economy. And this is a technical matter, which I'd be happy to talk to you about after the or maybe at the break later. But with interest on reserves in place, the Fed has the capacity to raise the federal funds rate above zero to fight inflation, even if it can't shrink its balance sheet or it's unwilling to shrink its balance sheet. There's a complication having to do with the government-sponsored enterprises, which, don't, which happen to hold reserves at the Federal Reserve for reasons that es escape me, since they're mortgage companies and they, they're not banks. But somewhere, some, somewhere back in the last decade or two, some politician managed to write a bill and, and, and allow the GSEs, these GSEs, to hold reserves directly at the central bank as if they were th something special. Um, anyway, they're there. They don't get interest on reserves. And as a result, they're dumping $100 billion of, of federal funds into the market every, every day with, with no ability to get interest on reserves. So the, the, the interest on reserves floor won't work for these institutions, and that's a problem. It's kind of a floor with a big hole in it. Uh, the Fed is... is, is, is furiously trying to figure out how to fill that hole. And you may see some more of this in the news in the next few weeks. So I think the question's a good one. I think it can work, but it, 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 there may be problems because of politics and uh, other things. Thank you. 
Uh, so the next question wasn't directed to anyone in particular, so since Ben has not had a turn yet, we'll uh, put him on the spot. Should the Fed have bailed out Lehman Brothers? <laughs> he knew I didn't have an answer for that. <laughs> So that being the case, I will go back to a previous question. <laughs> and uh, well, um, well, let's see before I do so. Maybe about Lehman Brothers. Um, well, I, I would just say that some of the people that, that the consensus now seems to be that uh, the um, Fed should have bailed out Lehman Brothers. That uh, by not doing so, they completely reversed courses in a way that disrupted the markets and uh, let everyone, and, you know, damaged everyone's belief in all the things that they believed in and this and the constancy of policy and things like that. And so, but at the time, many of the people who are arguing that now were saying uh, there should be no more bailouts. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, you know, I think that people who are experts on this, this issue are uh, don't, you know, it's hard, it's, it's something that's hard to have expertise on. Uh, so I just want to, so I'll want to spend my minute that I have to argue with Steve, <laughs> <laughs> who emphasized uh, all of these ways in which the conditions for uh, Pareto optimality for the first theorem of welfare economics to be met and pointed out how preposterous it was that they would be met in reality. Well, and I agree with everything he said, but it seems to me the relevant question is, uh, would you rather have the market doing this or have the United States Congress doing it for you? Would you believe that the regulators would, would make things better or worse? Think seriously about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and about the U.S. Congress and about all the regulatory agencies that get captured by the people that they're supposed to regulate before you make your decision. I would respond to that by saying I, I think actually the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act was, was a mistake. It allowed these investment banks to obtain the sizes that they obtained to the point that there is so much stake in this financial uh, system that you cannot let them fail. <laughs> and if they know you can't let them fail, there is a huge, huge moral hazard problem right there. And it's associated with the monopolization or the oligopolization of this industry. Well, it's hard to uh, have, uh, most of our monopolization occurs in places in which the government does something to make it easy. <laughs> well, unfortunately, yes. Okay, so our next question is a multiple choice question, so, uh, <laughs> so you can each answer one letter out of the, or, uh, one of the alternatives is other, so that leaves a fair amount of scope. Asia had a similar financial crisis back in 1997. Taking that in mind, should we actually, and uh, here are the four choices, A, follow what the Asians did, uh, do, B, do what we have been doing in the past by pumping money into the market, C, just let the market go back up eventually, and D, other. You're looking at me, huh? uh, I guess it's your turn, yes. <laughs> Anybody can um, tackle this. Well, there's a, one big difference is that um, back in the day, the East Asian currency crisis, the U.S. economy was strong. And it's one thing for the core economy of the planet Earth to go down and another thing for a, a peripheral part of the economy of the Earth to have problems. The source of, of strength that was available <coughs> in the United States, I think, you know, it framed the way that those economies were able to recover. In other words, they could, if they could recover themselves, then they would have export markets in the United States. And I think they chose paths which were uh, leveraged the fact that they had a strong United States economy that remained strong, which they could count on if they could get their own house in order. And they and they had to do the usual things. They had to, uh, you know, um, find some way to adjust the real exchange rate, which was commensurate with their with price stability and, and full employment. In our case, the U.S. economy going down, there's no source of strength, and we, we're it. And so we have to use a whole different series of approaches to policy than, than we would if we were a small, 
part of the world economy that could count on another part of the world economy against which to stabilize. So let me leave the answer there. It can get very technical, but I think that's a huge difference in perspective, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Okay, we have a, uh, thank you. We have a question for Steve. Your remarks pointed to the assumptions of the fundamental theorem of welfare economics that are not satisfied. How does this lead you to conclude how regulation can be improved in specific ways that would have avoided the crisis? Well, unfortunately, um, after the development of the theory of regulatory capture back in the, the 70s, which is actually a sort of intellectual driving force behind a lot of the deregulation that occurred uh, in the 70s and early 80s, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of research done on uh, how do you effectively regulate a market. Um, they're simple things. I mean, truly free markets are a jungle. I mean, you need a certain uh, legal framework. You can't have people engaging in transactions that they can then renege on and not have recourse to a court or some mechanism for enforcement. So it's a little impossible to talk about markets outside of the context of some sort of governmental uh, involvement. The question is, what's the right level? I agree with Ben. You don't want Congress uh, involved in regulating this. You know, uh, you guys as, as college students are vitally aware of this. Music is, uh, with free downloading and things like this, is becoming almost a public good. And normally with public goods, you have the government step in and, you know, dictate the allocations. Now, you guys really don't want Congress telling you what you can and can't listen to. So, uh, on the other hand, the Fed is an example, a good example of a regulatory body, which uh, was created in such a way that it is pretty much independent of Congress. It doesn't uh, have to buckle under to a lot of political pressure. Um, but unfortunately, there just hasn't been a lot of research done on this. Okay, thank you. Um, got so many good questions here, it's, uh, it's tough to choose. Uh, so, um, in, in some ways, monetary illusion was a big part of the housing bubble where people borrowed more than they actually had on paper because of increased housing prices. Similarly, the idea that a company is too big to fail creates inefficiency in that company does not uh, innovate such as GM. How can we create responsible policy that both stimulates the economy but is not blind consumption that may create indebtedness or market in our uh, in Increase indebtedness or market inversion. I'm not sure I got the last word. Anyway, I think it's your time, Ben. <laughs> Why don't we just leave it open for anyone? Okay. <laughs> so, do, he wants me. No, go so ahead. I'll, I'll say something that relates to what Steve was just saying. Um, I, I do agree that the too big to fail problem, which is referenced in this question, is the key key problem. And so one of the things that I think makes it easy for the government to support institutions that, that should, be, should not be supported is the fact that the Federal Reserve is an independent agency with a balance sheet that's, it, that, it's, that it has at its disposal by the vote of a majority of the Federal Open Market Committee of about 12 people. We've seen this year how on that vote of, of a very small group of people, it's able to create a trillion dollars uh, of new currency and lend it to whoever it wants to, to support companies. Because it's an institution that's independent of Congress, it can do so without getting congressional appropriations. That's part of the reason why it's independent. <clears throat> but it also has, is, it creates a situation where if companies become so big that they can't fail or if they don't think they can fail, they know that the independent Federal Reserve, because it's hanging out there, because it has the discretion because it's independent and because it has a balance sheet, will be almost pushed into lending rather than causing a worldwide calamity. So I think what we need to do is to somehow circumscribe the ability of the Federal Reserve to do that lending, that credit policy, to support these institutions. I would say, let's recognize this as a political matter. Let's put the taxpayer right in the loop and have this, this systemic oversight council that you've been batting around in the newspapers. Let's set it up. I'm in favor of it. And let's put it right in the Treasury's office where the President of the United States and his Treasury Secretary will be the point people on whether or not these, these, these credit policies should be initiated in the first place. Right now, with the Federal Reserve being an independent institution with the authority to initiate support policies, they just get pushed into the corner where they make it happen. It's not 
plausible for Ben Bernanke as one individual to let the whole world go down. But if he were representing taxpayers who were in the loop from the beginning, then maybe there would be some credibility that this, the government would not bail out these institutions, that there would be pushback, and maybe these institutions would take care of themselves ex ante so that they wouldn't need to be bailed out. This is a rather sophisticated point, but it says basically what Steve is saying. This is a political problem for our country. The only way to solve it is to make bailouts expli explicitly political and not pretend that they should be handled by the independent Federal Reserve. I don't know whether anybody could understand that, but uh, more or less what I think. So, well, so on, the, on the topic of the housing uh, price explosion that finally came down, <laughs> uh, I just rem just want to remind us that uh, a lot of this was really generated by governmental policies. The of course, we for many years had subsidization to homeowners in the form of uh, mortgage interest deduction from income taxes. And this is supposed to be in order to induce, to um, encourage home ownership. Well, there's Canada, who's a fairly a country that's somewhat similar to ours in many respects, right next door. And uh, they, they do not have uh, this subsidy to home ownership. And uh, people can, cannot uh, walk away from their uh, mortgage commitments. And they have a higher fraction of people of home ownership among the population than we have in the United States. So um, this seems like a, a, a pretty bad idea. Then there was the, the government creation of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to try and encourage home ownership by essentially by setting up entities that were bound to be bailed out, that were, were supposed to be understood to, to be government supported when they nominally weren't government supported. So they were paying huge salaries to private sector employees who were uh, earning incomes that were for, for, for entities that were earning much more than they would have otherwise because the public was tricked by the government into believing that they were government entities, which then it turned out that they were. So th this was just completely outrageous. And to say that none of this was foreseen by economists is, is crazy. I had you know, one friend who wrote five articles uh, that were put out by the Shadow Open Market Committee, which I was a member of at the time, arguing about the the bound to the bound to a writ about the fact that we were bound to have some sort of disaster come about sooner or later because of this. And so uh, you know economists would argue that and it would get into uh, Congress and some congressman who was a friend of these institutions and was head of the regulatory committee of the of the subcommittee of Congress who had uh, political power over these institutions but step in and and and, and, um, and protect them against any regulation against any change in rules that would have made them uh, into more responsible entities uh, and then there were these there were these government plans that uh, coerced that's Marvin can tell me if that word's too strong, that coerced banks and lending institutions to make loans to people who did not have uh, the income or the credit ratings to uh, uh, make, get regular mortgage loans. That were, there, were, there was coercion of banks to make loans to people without income, without jobs, without down payment, which uh, helped quite a bit in generating a housing bubble. Let me just, so the subprime, 
mortgage was actually, it's been, just to elaborate a little, was, was something that bankers were very much against 30, 40 years ago. And bankers had, they would, they would redline districts, which they wouldn't lend to because it was below prime and they believed they wanted to stick with prime. And the Congress passed a law called the Community Reinvestment Act, which berated banks for, for, for redlining whole districts of housing as loans which shouldn't be made because they're not likely to be repaid. In part, they weren't likely to be repaid because the collection process, the bankers knew, and I know this from personal experience, would not go well in the press. You'd be collecting against bad loans among poor people. That was the dynamic that set up the Community Reinvestment Act that started bankers moving in the direction of, quote, subprime lending because Congress pushed them to do it. And then what happened is they got very good at it and we got to crisis. Uh, so I think we are nearly out of time. Uh, so um, I, I have a nicely phrased question. I think it's, uh, we've addressed aspects of it, maybe all, but I will read it anyway. Uh, how can the central banks maintain their role as the lender of the last resort while avoiding moral hazard problems? Marvin um, talked a bit about well, yeah, that a I, I don't know whether there's more yeah. you would like to this say. This is a sort of odd question. The, the question is asked after I gave the answer. It was a nice phrasing. Okay, it's a great good. question. It's the key question. Whoever, I'd like to meet the person that asked that question. And I believe that since lender of last resort ultimately can, can morph into a fiscal policy by which taxpayers are roped into bailing out banks that shouldn't be bailed out because the last resort lending is exposed to that uh, unhelpful loop. I think the only way to get out in front of this is to make the authority to call on extensive last resort lending of the sort that went on this year, to lodge that authority explicitly in a political part of the government and take it out of the independent central bank. Because if you did that, then taxpayers would be involved in the loop right up front, knowing that they were going to get hit by a train down the road. And my feeling is that's the only way to get out of this. It wouldn't be easy, because we'd have to have some point of tension, some point of distress in the future where taxpayers push back and we had some problems. But the hope would be that if that was credible, bankers would not no longer believe that they would be too big to fail. So yeah, I love the question. It's exactly the key issue that we need to deal with as a result of this year. By the way, this, this year's problems, this last couple of years' problems, is almost certain to recur in a bigger way over the next 10 years or so, unless we get out in front of this, this very problem, I would say. It seems to me a corollary to this, too, is that we need uh, much more effective antitrust scrutiny over sure. uh, these That's large right. investment banks. Is there a technological reason that these banks should be as big as they are? Is there a benefit to the bigness, the way there's a benefit to you know, the bigness of Microsoft, say? Um, and that's just, uh, as a policy matter, it's been completely ignored. Well, if you're really radical, you could do away with uh, corporations and limited liability, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> with that modest proposal, uh, I think we, uh, we have run out of time. There are more questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but, uh, but thank you all for submitting these, uh, these excellent questions and, and thank the panel for their uh, excellent answers.